each of these shooters, the accuracy with which he can place each shot is of prime importance. An inaccurate rifle or cartridge is in the same class as an unfaithful wife, a leaky boat, or a bird dog that habitually faults points. We're better off without them. I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. This is Chuck Schreiber. Accuracy is his business, too. This is Ralph Insinger. Leo Lee. Ken Modero. Melvin Holmes, whose jobs are to build accuracy into the tools and dies and machines that make our bullets. making presses with all the loving care a mother bestows on an only child, Steve Bowden. Lee Stratman and Dennis O'Neill. Ron Miller. Richard Rizika and Gary Bolt. Ken Doms. Bob Andrews. This is the plant superintendent, Dale Franza. He worries a lot too, because accuracy is also his problem. And this is Reuben Hayes. He fires sample bullets from each of these machines in our super accurate test barrels to make certain that our accuracy standards are being met and to bring things to a halt if they're not. Our kind of accuracy isn't something easily come by. It isn't found anywhere in the world in its pure state and you cannot buy it by the pound. And even when you have it, it can easily slip away. We have to build it into our bullets carefully, a ten-thousandth of an inch and a tenth of a grain at a time. No, accuracy just doesn't happen. You have to make it happen with tools, with men, with materials, with machines, with bullets, and with rifles. This is the sort of 200-yard group a good many shooters get. As you can see, Hitting a prairie dog at that range would be pretty much a matter of good luck rather than good shooting. Even many woodchucks would be missed or only wounded at 200 yards or beyond. Varmint shooters really do need better accuracy than this, and they can get it. Take a good look at this target I've just started. Now let's see if I can put two more right in there. Good. Now that's what I call varmint accuracy. But we can only get it with a good rifle, properly bedded and having a smooth trigger pull. Shooting hand loads, carefully made from selected fire form cases with the proper powder charge and the best possible bullets seated to the right depth. However, bear in mind that factory ammo has to be made to fit all kinds of rifles with all kinds of chamber dimensions in a wide variety of actions. Bolt, slide, 
lever, auto loaders, and single shots. Hand loads, however, can be made up for an individual rifle and its chamber without compromise, so it can bring out its best capabilities, as it did with my rifle, and as it can with yours. This half minute of angle group really means that if our own shooting skill is up to it, prairie dogs can be consistently hit at 200 yards or more, and woodchucks can be cleanly killed at three to 400 yards. Now, what did it take to produce the hand loads that made this rifle shoot so well? Only these components. Empty once fired cases, primers, powder, bullets, plus this equipment. Powder measure, scales, loading press, a set of dies, some case lube, and a loading manual. Yes, such a book is also part of a hand loader's basic equipment just possibly the most important item of all, for here is contained the step-by-step -step instructions a novice needs to undertake the making of his own cartridges, plus most of the data required by both the beginner and the experienced reloader, regardless of the caliber gun or type of game for which he is loading. Hand loading could hardly be easier or safer. Unfortunately, hundreds of years ago, Gunpowder got a bad reputation because it blew up ships and buildings. Black powder ignited so easily and exploded so violently, like this. But modern smokeless powders, on the other hand, are propellants and merely burn when ignited unless tightly confined. In fact, you have many more dangerous substances around the house, like gasoline for your lawnmower, paint thinner, or hairspray. Remember, this is just a demonstration. We certainly don't recommend the use of flame around gunpowder. This film is not intended to teach you the basic steps of reloading. Your manual can do it much better there. But we want to show you certain aspects that are difficult to understand in words or still pictures. For securing the ultimate in accuracy and performance from your rifle and your ammo, it will help if you more fully understand some of the more complex factors involved. What really happened in the chamber of this rifle when the cartridge was fired? How was the case affected, the bullet? Perhaps we could better understand if we look directly into the chamber through the magic of movies using stop action and instant replay. Now we can exaggerate clearances that normally would be difficult to see and to slow down the action enough to give us time to observe and understand what is happening. This way we can see that this new factory load is a somewhat loose fit in this chamber and the bullet is not in perfect alignment with the bore, that the case doesn't contact the front of the chamber, but as the firing pin strikes it moves the case forward so that it does. This gives a little head space, though not a dangerous amount. As the firing pin continues and fires the primer, notice that the violence of the flash backs the primer partway out of the pocket. As the powder is ignited and the pressure builds up, the brass case expands to completely fill the chamber, preventing any escape of gas to the rear. As the pressure continues to build, the case is forced so tightly against the chamber walls that it cannot move but the brass eventually has to stretch in this area when the pressure is great enough to force the case head back against the bolt or breech block, the primer then being reseated in its pocket. As the bullet exits up the barrel, the pressure drops, the case cools and contracts enough to extract easily. This is a 308 case fired with a normal load but in a chamber having excess headspace. It is a classic example of how excess headspace causes cases to stretch at this critical point. It would almost certainly have separated on the next firing as did this case. 
But now, let's look at another type of case, the rim type. Notice that as the firing pin hits the primer, the case cannot move forward appreciably because the rim, not the shoulder, positions it. Because the rimmed head is virtually in contact with the bolt face or breech block, this case will not stretch as much here as did the rimless case we looked at first, unless the action is an exceptionally weak or stretchy one. There is a third type of popular rifle case, the belted type, the so-called magnum. The belt is, in effect, the rim moved forward rather than at the rear. It chambers like this. Being positioned by the belt, it is moved forward only slightly by the firing pin, regardless of the space at the shoulder. After firing, there is very little stretch in the critical head region. Let's have a look at that rimless case, the 243 we first had in that animated chamber. Remember, it was expanded to fit the chamber exactly, and it could now be put back in, except the neck at least will have to be resized because it will not now hold a bullet. So, here we are, face to face with a decision that plagues and confuses so many reloaders, whether the neck size only or the full length resize that cartridge case. Let's just neck size first and see what that does for us. Because this die does not exert pressure on the body of the case, no lubrication is required. All we need to do is dip the neck lightly in some powdered graphite, then into the die it goes. Most cartridge cases can be neck sized only in a normal full length die by unscrewing it slightly. But a proper neck die like this is best. A primer, and now we'll switch dies so we can seat a new bullet when we're ready for it. Some powder, a bullet, and we're in business again. Next sizing not only will extend case life to a remarkable degree, for reasons we'll go into later, but even more important, it usually promotes better accuracy. Because now, when this cartridge is chambered in the same rifle, it is an almost perfect fit. Head space is just right with all cases, be they rimmed, belted, or rimless. And what is even more helpful, the bullet is almost perfectly aligned with the bore. When this cartridge is fired, the striker does not drive the case forward because the shoulder is already in virtual contact with the chamber. And because the head has always been in contact with the bolt face, the case is not subject to stretching in this critical area. But even if you adjust your full length size die to eliminate any excess head space, as I've just done, you can see the brass is still being worked by the size die. Reducing the diameter of the case lengthens it as the metal has to go somewhere. But now this case is no longer the perfect fit for the chamber that it was after it had first been fired. Except for having no excess head space, it is almost as loose a fit as a brand new case. Nevertheless, it does present the bullet well aligned with the bore. Of course, there could be some misalignment due to case or chamber eccentricity. If a shooter continues to full length resize his cases, the cases will lengthen, require trimming, possibly after three or four rounds. It must be trimmed because when it is chambered in this condition, the mouth or edge of the neck will come up against the chamber's throat before the bolt has fully closed or the case shoulder has contacted the chamber. Because the bolt has such powerful camming action, this varmint shooter never realizes that he is actually crimping the case mouth firmly into the bullet and that at this point the case is solidly wedged between the throat and the bullet so that it cannot expand to release the bullet. Therefore, pressure can and most certainly will go dangerously high. Just watch what happens. Man, I sure put together a hot load that time.
Hot load of Harry doesn't realize just what a hot load he did have or why it gave him such a belt in the cheek. But if he doesn't study his loading manual or get some advice from a friend who knows something about loading, he'll end up with something much worse than a sore face. Hey, son, take a good look at that case head. You thought it was only a good hot load, but it was really a dangerous one, and you'll find the case head says so, just as plainly as if it could talk. Isn't there a sort of a crater around the firing pin mark, and isn't the primer itself pretty well flattened? Sure is. And wasn't the brass extruded into the ejector slot? Yes, sir. Toss that case to me, and I'll see just how much too long it is. Just as I thought, almost 20 thousandths too long. And 3 thousandths head expansion. 3 thousandths may not sound like much, but even a half a thousandths is an indication of high pressure. You better do a little homework in your loading manual and keep this to remind you to look after your cases. Bear in mind they're trying their best to keep 50 thousand pounds per square inch of hot gas from getting in your eye. While necks are lengthened by full-length resizing, case life is shortened for the continuous working of the brass between the chamber and the die stretches it and will eventually produce the crack, then complete head separation. Hot loads, even if the necks are trimmed as needed, speed up this process. So, my advice is to neck size only whenever possible. But remember, it is necessary to full-length resize for pumps, lever actions, and auto loaders, and even for bolt action rifles if the cartridge cases will be used in a different gun. Joyce, I think we should remind the shooters that bullet seating has a considerable effect on accuracy in many rifles. Yes, and on pressure and velocity. Could we have that drawing of the rifle's chamber again? Good. You see this section just ahead of the chamber before the rifling starts? This is called the lead, throat or free bore. It is really the bore of the barrel with the rifling reamed away. It varies considerably in length and in the angle at which the rifling is cut, according to the views of different factories, cartridge designers, barrel, and gun makers. This variation in the distance a bullet travels before entering the rifling results in great differences in velocity and pressure with any given load and different rifles. I'll show you why. This is a normal load with a bullet seated to allow what would actually measure about one thirty-second of an inch before it contacts the rifling. Notice how the pressure builds very steadily and smoothly, even as the bullet enters the rifling. Now we'll take the same load with the bullet seated deeper, so it can travel further before taking the rifling. This bullet meets no resistance as it moves through the throat and so gets a good run at the rifling. Pressure is lower than normal, and because the gas has more room in which to expand, the pressure never reaches our normal figure, nor does the velocity, which was only 3,400 instead of 3,500 feet per second. Let's take our standard load and see how it's affected if we seat the bullet well out so that we'll actually contact the rifling and be marked by it, like this. As the bullet is already touching the rifling, it does not move while the pressure is still low. And because it does not get a run at the rifling, as did the other bullets, it takes greatly increased pressure to force it into the rifling. And now, because the rapidly expanding gases find less room than they should have at this time in their burning, the pressure rise is both rapid and excessive. Velocity is also high at 3,650 feet per second, but at the expense of rather dangerous pressure. If your rifle delivers its best accuracy with the bullet just touching the rifling, as many do, you can safely seat your bullet this way, if you'll only remember to load a few grains less powder. This lighter load will still give you normal velocities without high pressure. One thing that shooters maybe should keep in mind where they have a rifle that's, oh, a couple thousand, maybe more rounds through it, if the throat's rotated out a little, that if they would seat their bullets out farther, that maybe it would increase the accuracy, at least for a while it should. 
You know, many shooters assume the primer shoots its jet of flame only a half inch or so into the powder charge. But actually, the primer flame penetrates the entire powder charge to the base of the bullet, igniting the whole charge instantaneously. The burning rate is determined by the chemical composition of the powder, the grain size, and the coating on the powder. If you doubt the ability of a primer to shoot its flames so far, look what happens when I fire a prime but empty case. Notice that I could not cock the hammer or turn the cylinder. That's because the primer has blasted out of the primer pocket tight against the recoil plate. I'll drive the case down over the primer reseating it, which is exactly what happens when you fire a live cartridge. It's remarkable the number of things that can affect the accuracy of a bullet. After firing, oh, 50,000 test groups over the years, I think I've learned about all the tricks there is to hand loading for accuracy. But you still can't make a bad bullet shoot good. Well, not even in barrels, test barrels like this. Uh, yesterday, for instance, press number six developed a couple of thousands play in the transfer feed. And this is a result, not like this. Here we are, back to those vital thousandths and ten thousandths of an inch. No matter how perfect the basic design of the bullet may be, they aren't going to be consistently accurate unless we can make them all to closer tolerances than, say, a Rolls-Royce engine. Perfect balance is probably the most critical factor in bullet accuracy. We must therefore, in all stages of our production, try to maintain almost perfect concentricity in our cups and in the jackets into which they are drawn. This has made an even more difficult problem by our need to internally shape the jacket to control expansion in our hunting bullets. If the jacket is not uniform around its entire circumference, even if it varies as little as five ten thousandths of an inch, the finished bullet may be unbalanced enough to veer off its intended line of flight. Some animation may show why. The green dot represents the center of form of this bullet and is at its actual dimensional center. The red dot indicating the center of balance of this bullet should also be at the same exact spot. But because the jacket of this bullet has a thinner wall on one side, there is more lead there. And so it is heavier there and the center of balance has moved ever so slightly in that direction, perhaps less than a thousandth of an inch. Immense care is taken to balance the crankshaft and moving parts of a Ferrari engine because it might be revved up to 9,000 RPM when the driver makes a spectacular takeoff. If we could rig a tachometer on that bullet as it exits a 10-inch twist barrel at 3,000 feet per second, what do you think it would read? 10,000 revolutions per minute, 20,000, or as much as 50,000? Guess again that bullet will be spinning over 200,000 revolutions per minute. That's why exact balance is so much of a concern to us. Environment hunters, sheep hunters too, and maybe even elephant hunters. As long as the bullet is in the barrel, it rotates around its center of form. But when it leaves the barrel, it spins around its center of gravity. And this causes it to veer slightly off course at a tangent to the spiral described by its center of gravity as it went up the bore. Less than half a thousandth of an inch error in jacket concentricity can and does have a detrimental effect upon a bullet's course. And because we cannot chamber each bullet with its center of gravity similarly aligned in the barrel, subsequent shots will diverge at arbitrary angles, slight though they may be. And so... We have a group with more dispersion than we would like. But by mining all those ten thousandths of an inch and tenths of grains in all stages of production, we are able to make millions of bullets capable of exceptional accuracy 
in a variety of calibers having expansion characteristics suitable for target, varmint, and big game hunting. Doing your shooting with super accurate and effective cartridges, which you yourself have loaded, not only provides more shooting for your money, but better shooting. Plus giving an invaluable sense of pride in your own craftsmanship. Like it says in the beginning of the loading manual, a shooter is his own man. <laughs>